Blog Talk Radio. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. We started out in Denver. We're in the middle of it now in Cleveland, Ohio, with the American Sports History Podcast, hosted by Peter Ray. Yours truly, Mark Mancini, producing it, 347-205-9631. You can catch the archive version on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini Sports Podcast platforms, wherever you subscribe to, powered now by Mancini Media. So without further ado, as we lay the red carpet down, put the podium in its place, hand off the mic to you, Peter. First of all, how are you? Second of all, how can people get a hold of you? Third of all, between this guest and the other, Jack, uh, James Donaldson over there, boy, you are running some great shows and getting noticed across the board in Cleveland, and props to you, my friend. Oh, hi, Mark. I appreciate that. I'm doing well, and I have a YouTube channel. I make history videos. Actually, yeah, the, uh, the the name of the YouTube channel is my name, Peter J. Ray, R-E-A. We've made, actually, every year Cleveland baseball, going back to 1869. You're absolutely right. Tonight, for the third time, we have Mr. Sam McDowell, who pitched in Major League Baseball from 1961 to 1975 for the Cleveland Indians, uh, San Francisco Giants, New York Yankees, and Pittsburgh Pirates. And he won 141 games, 2,453 strikeouts, second all-time to Bob Feller for Cleveland. He has one of the highest strikeouts per nine innings in MLB history, 8.86. Six-time American League All-Star, 1970 Sporting News American League Pitcher of the Year. And he's got a book coming out tomorrow. Oh, wow. The Saga of Sudden Sam, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of Sam McDowell coming out uh, tomorrow. This Things are at fever pitch in Cleveland. Back in the late 60s, he was one of the best pitchers in baseball into the into the 70s. In fact, in Cleveland, kids would say, oh, to be Sam McDowell. In fact, 1989, Cleveland even uh, uh, traded for oh, to be McDowell, uh, which seems pretty interesting. So welcome to the show for the third time, Mr. Sam McDowell. Thank you, Peter. It's good to be here. Now, we stopped last time in 1964. We're going through your career. Uh, I'd like to what, – uh, what do you remember about uh, Louis Tiant, playing with Louis Tiant? Well, Louis, I, uh, I happened to be fortunate to be at Portland in the minor leagues. They sent me back at the beginning of the 64 season, and that was the year that Cleveland got Louis Tiant from uh, a Mexican league uh, baseball team. And he was at uh, Portland with me. And, in fact, uh, we had a pitching staff in Portland that to this day we've got over 30 records that have yet to be broken with the Pacific Coast League, but, uh, that's, which is neither here nor there. But I got to know Louis pretty well, a very funny guy, a great pitcher, a great young man. And I remember specifically the day that he came up to the big leagues uh, he and I pitched a doubleheader against the Yankees, and we both uh, won our games against the Yankees. And that was his introduction to the big leagues. Did he talk much about not being able to see his parents because of the uh, Fidel Castro's communist government in Cuba? Well, he really didn't talk about that much. Uh, he understood the situation. And he brought it up periodically. Uh, in fact, it was tragic because he didn't have the chance to go back there, obviously. And ironically, about five, six years ago, uh, we were in a tournament, American Airlines tournament down in uh, St. Croix, the Virgin Islands. And he had just gotten back. Uh, there was a special program that had been uh, financed that took Louis back to Cuba to visit all his relatives that were still alive, to visit his parents, to, the, the one that was alive. Uh, and they got to see the house that he was born in, that the parents lived in. And it was so tragic because they had openings in the ceiling where you could see through to the sky. And this was Cuba, or this is Cuba, because you can't get anything there. Nobody's got any money. Nobody's got anything. And it was, it was very sad. It was an interesting program that I probably saw four, five, six times uh, on television. 
but he finally got the chance to go back to see them. I thought, I, yeah, he's one of my favorite guys uh, because he had such a good uh, attitude and he was going through this long separation with his parents and he was an only child and I thought he was such a dignified man. And, and of course, he had such a good sense of humor. I, there must have been a lot of pain behind that. The uh, And reportedly, he, he smoked cigars in the shower. Can you comment on that? He smoked cigars everywhere, in the shower, in the whirlpool, in the bathroom, everywhere. <laughs> How, did, he, did he wash his hair if he was smoking a cigar? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and uh, able to keep it lit, <laughs> keep it going. Yeah, the, the, the deal was he didn't have much hair to begin with, so it wasn't much of a big deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on to 1965, Rocky Calavito. Uh, Rocky, in fact, I was just uh, uh, talking with Rocky about oh, a month ago. And uh, Rocky is a real class act. Uh, probably, uh, I would say in the top three or four that you might say was the ultimate gentleman as a, uh, uh, a sports athlete. Uh, it was a lot of ballyhoo with him coming back to Cleveland. Uh, sadly, it was near the end of his career, but uh, he still was uh, producing and did a pretty good job. Uh, Rocky's one of my friends, and uh, even to this day, we do things together. Uh, but what I remember most about Rocky was, if you were to close your eyes and open them and not realize who it was, Watching Rocky at the plate, you would swear it was Joe DiMaggio. He copied every single facet of Joe DiMaggio's swing, how he took care of his bats. He had the cleanest bats in baseball. Uh, I mean, they shined, uh, and he cleaned them before of every game. Uh, Rocky wore a suit and tie everywhere, including home games, which nobody did in those days. Uh, and as I said, he was just a terrific gentleman, but I will say this, he had probably the strongest and the best arm I've ever seen from any player in the outfield. And it was so good that as I'm sure you are aware, uh, he also pitched in the major leagues, both for Cleveland and for the Yankees. Right. I, yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, Mel from Las Vegas says, hi, hi, Mel. Sal from Germantown, Pennsylvania, says he's going to get your book. He says at least uh, Sam McDowell might show these players today how to throw more than two innings. <laughs> well, back in our day, we were embarrassed if we didn't pitch all nine innings. Uh, and, I mean, we were seriously embarrassed because uh, that was the thing. That's why you were a pitcher in the uh, starting pitcher in the olden days. By the way, speaking about the book, I got news yesterday from the publisher that the first time in history that a book was sold out before it was uh, uh, put out to the public, uh, they printed 1,500 books, and as of last week, they were sold out. Uh, we, have a deal, we have a deal coming up in Cleveland in Strongsville in two weeks where we needed 200 books, and we called the publisher to purchase 200 books so we would have them there. And they said, sorry, they don't have any. Uh, and because of the paper shortage, they're not going to be able to produce another 2,500 books until at least April. So we're going to try and fend for ourselves. Uh, we only have, we're going to be there for three days signing books, and we only have 75 of them. So anybody in the strong, uh, Strongsville area, of Ohio, if you want an autographed book, I suggest you get there early. And there's going to be a second printing? Uh, not until April. Okay. Uh, Rick from Newark, New York, says, uh, says, Peter, you're great with James Donaldson one week, Sam McDowell the next. Your trio blows every sports station in my neck uh, in my neck of the world. So thank you very much, Rick, for those kind words. Um, uh, now moving on, another team that you had, 1965, Chuck Hinton. 
Yeah, Chunk uh interesting outfielder. Uh, we got him from the Washington Senators. Um, I would I would say that he was a pretty good ball player uh, as an outfielder, uh, but uh, I don't think he really got a chance to really show his prowess because we didn't exactly have the uh, power to be in front of him or behind him. So they could pitch around him a lot, uh, except when, when Max Alvis was in front of him. Then they couldn't be at Max Alvis was a home run threat and a great hitter. So uh, uh, if he was around Chuck Hinton, and then they would have to pitch to Chuck. But that was the problem with our team was a lot of the pitchers coming into town could pitch around most of our power hitters, which we only had two. Uh, sometimes three, uh, same way they used to pitch around Rocky. Walter from Peabody, Massachusetts says, hi, fellas. Well, he would love to know what Sam thinks of Sonny Siebert, Fred Lynn, and Joe Charbonneau. Oh, there's a uh, set of bookends. <laughs> well, uh, Joe Charbonneau, uh, pretty good guy, nice friend. Uh, enjoy being with him in Cleveland. Uh, was a very interesting fella uh, that fought an awful lot of his demons. As you know, he was the rookie of the year and then gone from baseball the following year. Uh, spent one year in the big leagues uh, and that very impressive year, but then that was it. Uh, Sonny Siebert, uh, here's a guy that uh, made himself a major league standout pitcher from being an outfielder. He was signed with the Cleveland Indians as an outfielder because he could hit pretty good. He also played uh, professional basketball, which very few people uh, remember. Uh, But Sonny Siebert uh, was kind of told that while in the minor leagues that there were so many hitters that were like him that his chances of making it to the major leagues in short order weren't very good. So he decided his arm was strong enough. He became a pitcher and became a pretty doggone good pitcher. He was one of our top four when we set all the records in Cleveland. And Fred Lynn? Fred Lynn, just a pesky little hitter. I know he caused everybody problems, uh, Fred Lynn, uh, as a hitter. Uh, He wasn't going to hit you know, 40 and 50 home runs a year. But he sure as heck was going to make certain that you earned your money if you're pitching against them. Duke Sims. Duke Sims was one of the many catchers that I had had at Cleveland. Uh, I had about 12 uh, during the years I was with Cleveland. I seemed every year or two we had a new one come up. Uh, Obviously, you know, the Ray Fossey was probably one of the greatest tragedies uh, in baseball, uh, which was one of my catchers right after Duke. But Duke was a pretty good uh, catcher, uh, quite intelligent, uh, pretty good home run hitter. It was a rarity. He hit from the left side of the plate and yet was a total right-hander in everything he did. Steve Hargan. Steve Hargan was one of our top four or five pitchers during that era uh, in which we had, uh, uh, we set all the records in Cleveland, uh, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, and 70. Steve Hargan was right up there with us. Uh, He made himself a pretty good pitcher. He was not really born with any major talent, per se. Had a fastball and a slider, threw pretty hard, had excellent control, and the guts of a burglar. Okay, the 1966 Cleveland Indians, Chico Salmon. Chico Salmon. And he would make sure you called him Salmon. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Chico was a pretty good defensive infielder. 
a pretty good guy. Uh, he was instrumental without really realizing it in getting me tossed out of the major league in a game the only time uh, in my baseball career I got thrown out of a game. It's when we traded him to Baltimore, and I was pitching against the Baltimore Orioles, and we were winning 2-1, to one, and they had uh, an umpire, Barnett, behind the plate, and it was his first game in the major leagues. And he was as much a homey umpire as you could possibly have. His first game behind home plate, he didn't want boo, didn't want anybody getting on his case. And he had missed quite a few pitches. And I had three and two on Chico Simone. And I threw a slider. In fact, it scared me because I made the mistake. I threw it right down the middle of the plate. And normally those get hit out uh, of the ballpark. But in this case, he called it a ball. And I went berserk. And uh, I walked him, and the umpire came out, threw me out of the game. And that was the game in which the umpire asked me for the ball, and I said, here, go get it. And I turned, and I threw it out of the stadium. (laughs) Where do you throw it? into Center field? No, behind home plate, up out of the stadium. Okay, (laughs) out of the stadium. Oh, good, pretty good toss. Uh, Vern Fuller. Vern Fuller, uh, a very religious man. A very good man, a great defensive player. Uh, he had the range uh, like nobody I've ever seen. Uh, he could cover from first base all the way beyond uh, second base. Uh, just a good all-around young man. Later on, became very rich, uh, went to school, became a manager at hotels, wound up uh, owning hotels. Dick Raddatz. The monster. Big Dick. Uh, There's an interesting situation where when Cleveland finally got him, uh, he had that mental block uh, that, uh, remember, Steve Blass for Pittsburgh had, uh, where he just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, couldn't throw strikes. And so in order to attempt to try and throw strikes, he threw bullets at one time. But he would back off from uh, the speed that he had trying to gain his control back, and, of course, that didn't work. But Dick Reyes was uh, one of the great guys, one of the great cards and jokesters in baseball, him and Gary Bell. Don McMahon. Don McMahon, uh, here's a guy that had the guts of a burglar, you might say. Uh, I don't know. He spent close to 20 years pitching in baseball. Uh, Then ultimately became my pitching coach at San Francisco. Uh, Just an all-around great guy. And as I said, he had the guts of a burglar. He was a long reliever for, I'd say, probably 15 of his 20 years in the major leagues. He was a bulldog. The 1967 Cleveland Indians, Joe Adcock, manager. Used to be my roommate when when he was with the Indians that one year before they traded him to the Angels. uh, He was my roommate, you might say, the two biggest roommates in baseball history until Stan Williams later on became my roommate. Uh, But Joe Adcock had one of the heaviest bats in baseball. Frank Howard and Richie Allen were the other two that had 40 ounce bats and he swung it like as if it was uh, a toothpick. And, uh, uh, he was a guest hitter, 100% a guest hitter. And as a manager, he signed a two-year contract, as you know, with the Indians to become the manager, and he lasted one year. Uh, he had kind of a difficult time, really, uh, with all the different uh, wherewithal that goes on to being a manager. 
Gabe Paul, general manager. <laughs> Gabe Paul. Well, I made the statement one year that if I ever had money and needed to invest it in the team, I would want to make damn sure that Gabe Paul was the money man of the team, that he was the one that took care of everything that had to do with the finances. But he had difficulty with the players. Uh, he had a very difficult time with uh, uh, all most of the players that were on the team for two reasons. One, he was not going to spend any money. Number two, he didn't have any to spend. And so he had uh, uh, tried to take uh, advantage of every situation he could to try and keep the team in existence. In fact, at one time he had five different presidents of different banks in Cleveland area on the board of directors because he had borrowed so much money from each one of the banks in order just to keep the team there. Tony Horton. Tony Horton, a very sad case, a very sad situation. Back in those days, baseball did not know how to handle anybody that had an emotional problem or a psychological problem, and Tony did. Uh, but we got him from Boston. As a hitter, I I believe he could have been one of the greatest hitters in the history of baseball. He was just a natural. I mean, he could hit no matter what. And it didn't matter who you were pitching, what you were throwing, he could hit. Uh, but sadly, the game got to him emotionally. And he had to leave the game and never came back. Uh, left the game in his prime. Have, have you talked to him since then? I talked to him about two years after he had left the game when we were out there playing against the Angels in Anaheim. Uh, he lived there in Southern California. And he was doing all right. Larry Brown. Larry Brown, a little pesky hitter, a little guy, uh, played both second and short, mostly short. Uh, I would say average uh, infielder, a little pesky hitter, uh, never really hit for that much average, but a good all-around guy. Lee May. Arthur Lee May. He made sure everybody knew his full namer was Arthur Lee May. Uh, pretty good hitter. Pretty good guy. Pretty good hitter. Uh, did have a big weakness with that curveball. Uh, as long as uh, he could try and force the pitcher into throwing fastballs, he's a pretty good hitter. But the minute they started throwing a wrinkle up there, he was in trouble. Richie Shinebloom. Richie, uh, a very proud Jewish young man, a very religious young man, a very good and decent young man, a very nice guy, a switch hitter. I thought he was a damn good hitter, both left or right-handed, either way. Uh, and I'm not really sure why he got traded so much to so many teams. I mean, he played for five or six or seven teams, was in the big leagues for like 15 years. Uh, I know that he had size, I don't know, 14 shoes, uh, and he could not run a lick. I mean, you could get a turtle to outrun him. Uh, and I'm sure that was one of the biggest drawbacks. But he could hit, and he was a pretty good all-around guy. Yeah, I, I, think, I think he's the guy who was, uh, he said he had a negative cycle out at first, second, third at home and home, and, and kept getting thrown out at first on hits to the outfield because he couldn't run. I wouldn't say he kept getting hit uh, out. But I remember once or twice where he hit a line drive to right field, and they were able to throw him out at first base. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty tough. 
Uh, Ray Fossey. Ray Fossey, to me, I considered him to have as much talent as Johnny Bench uh, or any other Hall of Fame catcher. He was exemplary, both as a man, as a player, as a gentleman. He had more talent than any uh, individual player I ever saw. Uh, He could hit. And, of course, he was in that collision, a very intelligent man. And he was in that collision in 1970 in the All-Star game. Uh, Going to the All-Star game, he was hitting something like 370. And he had that collision with Pete Rose, uh, broke his collarbone, only nobody knew it. Back in those days, uh, the x-ray machines weren't exactly that uh, revealing. And uh, they said he was fine. It was just a bad bruise. Uh, And so he went on to try and play. Later on in the wintertime, they had x-rays taken again and found out he actually broke the collarbone and it healed back the wrong way uh, underneath each other. And back in those days, they didn't know how to break it apart and operate it on like they do today to fix it up and reheal it. And so it ruined his career, basically, that collision. He went on to be traded to the uh, athletics, played for them a couple of years, then became their radio and television announcer for like 45 years. Uh, just passed away, uh, I guess, a couple months ago. Stan Williams. <clears throat> Stan Williams, we called him animal because he was so strong. He had the largest hands of anybody I ever saw. And when he shook your hand, he intentionally shook it in such a way until you screamed. Uh, he could crunch your hand. Uh, a lot of people don't really recognize or think of him that much when they talk about all the great pitchers in Cleveland during the 60s and the early 70s. And the ironic part about it was he was very valuable uh, during those five years of the 60s. And if you look at his record, he was the spot starter, the fifth starter out of our group. And he did a magnificent job uh, for us. He also was unbelievable at uh, filling out crossword puzzles. He used to take pride in uh, taking on the toughest crossword puzzles from the different newspapers throughout the country and did an amazing job. The 1968 Cleveland Indians, Alvin Dark, manager. Best manager I ever played for because he changed and altered how people handled me. Most people didn't know it, but every manager that I had in baseball when I got to the big leagues, they would call my pitches for me. And I wasn't permitted to call my own game at all until they would send me back to the minor leagues when I didn't do too well uh, with their pitches. But then when I go to the minor leagues, there was no pitching coach there for me. So I was left to fend for myself. And as the record shows, I always did outstanding. But then they'd bring me up to the big leagues and call my pitches again. And uh, Alvin Dark, when he became manager, the very first week in spring training, it brought me into the clubhouse, sat me down and said, Sam, we know that everybody's called your pitches. We're not going to do that. We're going to help you learn how to become a pitcher in the big leagues. And he said, in fact, that's why I hired Jack Sanford, so that he would help you on a day-to-day basis. And it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in baseball. Our, our guest has been Sam McDowell, MLB pitcher from 1961 to 1975, and he's got a book coming out tomorrow, uh, the, Sa- the Saga of Sudden Sam, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of Sam McDowell by Sam McDowell uh, with, and Martin, Marty Gitlin, forward by Steve Garvey. The time has flown by. Mr. McDowell, do you have any final words for our audience? Well, first of all, I'm Sam, Mr., but I thank you. 
Uh, and no, not really. They just enjoy being with you guys and talking baseball, uh, especially these days when there isn't any. Well, it's been really wonderful having you on. We've we've got we have a ways to go. We're moving through your career. Hope I hope you can come on again. And I'm very ex- happy. I'm gonna. I, I ordered the book, your book, so it's supposed to come tomorrow. I'm really excited about getting it. And thanks so much for coming on again. I'll call you. Hopefully, get schedule another time next week. We'll have James Donaldson again, former NBA player and and leader in and advocate in mental health. Uh, dear listener, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, Mr. Sam McDowell. Good night. Good night.